Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Frank Quinn from Heritage, Ohio, and welcome to our webinar. It's November 18th, and the topic of the day is decorative plaster. And I'm excited today because we have some real experts in the house, in the virtual house, as it were. Uh, we have David Riccio from John Canning and Company Limited, and I'd like to just say a few words about David. So uh, David is a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works and is an Association for Preservation Technology, or APT, recognized professional. He's an integral part of John Canning and Company in his position as a principal and president of the company. He's been a visionary leader for the entire Canning team for more than 20 years. David is an industry recognized expert on historic flat and ornamental plaster, as well as decorative painting techniques, gilding and glazing, and has developed multiple innovative solutions for complex restoration conditions. He's worked as a consultant for architects, construction managers, and owners for historic and landmark buildings throughout the United States. As a champion of education, David continues to share his knowledge of the architectural arts with clients and professionals by offering presentations, leading workshops, and professional development presentations and webinars such as what we're doing today. So folks, pay attention to your chat box. If you are on this and interested in getting AIA credit for today's webinar, we have a form that you can fill out and it comes back to us and we will take care of getting your AIA credits for you. So uh, David is going to start us off. He's gonna run through the presentation. If you have questions or a chat about anything, feel free to ask those questions in the question box or drop a message in the chat box. If you have any issues with the hardware, or I'm sorry, the software, I can't help you with your hardware, but on GoToWebinar with the software, a lot of times you can solve problems just by closing out and reopening the application back up, okay? So with that out of the way, I will go ahead and turn it over to David. Hey, thank you for that. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm gonna, as we talked, as mentioned here, we're gonna get into decorative plastering and I'm gonna, a little bit of an introduction about some of the work we do. I'm gonna kind of go through that quickly so we can get in, dive deep into uh, decorative ornamental plaster and uh, flat plaster, uh, traditional uses of it. I'd also like to cover the installation of new plaster, and I'm gonna show you a case study, uh, ornamental and flat plaster at the Maryland State House, uh, the old Senate chamber. And if time allows, I'd like to get into plaster patching, albeit ornamental, complex kind of uh, decorative ceilings and how we deal with that sometimes and why that comes about. Uh, I will also show you, if time allows, uh, just a small case study on exterior plaster. Believe it or not, plaster, um, gypsum plaster is sometimes used uh, for ornamental capitals and ceiling features um, on the exterior of buildings, um, porticos and such. And it seems unusual and it kind of is, but we do come across that, so I thought I'd share that with you. And then if I can, uh, I would like to get into plaster stabilization and consolidation. But my understanding is the presentation today is really to focus on uh, dealing with uh, and sharing uh, uh, thoughts about ornamental plaster. Um, so I'm gonna get into that, but uh, do we have an hour? Do we have 90 minutes? What is the time frame I have here to work with? Well, I think we officially had set this up as a 90 minute webinar. So uh, with some Q&A time right up till 2.30. Great. Um, however, um, we're not really constrained by time. And if people need to leave the webinar, they can do that. But once these webinars are done, we post them to our YouTube channel. So if someone missed the last 10 or 15 minutes, they can always catch it on YouTube. Okay, wonderful. Um, that sounds like a plan. Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll try and get to that. If anyone has questions, can they ask me, or is it through the through the chat? But I don't, I don't mind feeling, fielding questions as long as it doesn't deviate, you know, from the subject matter too much and 
kind of uh, take us off track time-wise, but I'm glad to field questions or clarify things if, if they come about. Sure, if you would like to answer questions as they come up, I can um, go ahead and break in with Please. some breaking news on the question front and uh, we can kind of do it that way, okay? Okay, I'll proceed then. Super. Uh, so here's our, uh, of, of, of course, this is AIA continuing education credits. We are a provider and you can see our provider number up in the top hand corner. Uh, and as part of AIA, we are obligated, of course, to, oh, what's going on here? Um, okay, I have to use my mouse. Uh, show you uh, some of the requirements. And of course, our course description, uh, as I mentioned already, we're gonna get into the steps and processes of ornamental and flat plaster and uh, restoration where possible. Um, so our learning objectives, which is also a requirement. Uh, the uses of plaster, uh, the fabrication materials, we'll cover all of that. But without further ado, getting into the presentation, and just uh, Ohio Heritage, just uh, we just received an award for from Ohio Heritage for the Fulton County uh, Courthouse, um, in, and, and uh, it was the the uh, plea uh, courtroom. And you can see in this photo, it's really kind of in desperate shape. Uh, beautiful classical architecture, but um, really kind of dreary and misuse of colors uh, and fabrics and materials. Uh, the artwork up in the upper register of the walls are really discolored. You can't even really make out what the scenes are. Uh, the tin press ceiling has been painted over, no longer has that beautiful metallic look that it once did, uh, including uh, the, the uh, skylight that is uh, has damaged uh, uh, glass and canes are broken and uh, of course, woodwork is damaged. So we went in through a full restoration, um, including plaster work. But uh, I really just thought it uh, this was important to share this this project with you. Uh, and I think this is how we ended up uh, today uh, through the, in this presentation. So I'm, gonna, I'm sorry about that. Okay. It just uh, you can see again a little detail of the of the upper wall, the paintwork, uh, some of the damage to it. Uh, but uh, this is the overall completed work. Um, and, and hence, I, I think we received the award because it is transformative. We, put, we studied and found the original colors uh, and treatments and put those back. Uh, of course, we repaired the plaster. If you'd notice the four murals are paintings down low, though the plaster frames were uh, discarded at, at one point, And so we had to repair those. The column shafts at the bottoms were uh, taken out as you saw in the earlier photo and of course all the artwork was uh, clean and preserved and and uh, the ceiling was uh, redecorated as it should have been. Uh, in terms of some of the work we do, uh, we are a national company. Uh, we are based in a little farm town called Cheshire in Connecticut, in central Connecticut, but uh, we work in our backyard. We have Yale University and do a lot of work at Yale, but uh, our, the breadth of our work has taken us all the way to Hawaii and many points in between. As a matter of fact, after this presentation today, I do get on a plane to uh, South Dakota for some work there. So we do get around. Uh, we've worked at uh, uh, University of Virginia. Uh, we've worked in the Rotunda and the Academic Village. Of course, this was designed by Thomas Jefferson in the first public university in America. And at, at uh, UVA, we've done plaster work, as you can see in the lower photo in the middle. Uh, of the eagle, that's a plaster eagle at the portico of the entrance of the building. So it's on the outside. Uh, we've done wood graining of their doors at all the uh, um, dorm rooms. And of course, and this room building here, lower right-hand corner photo is uh, Garrett Hall, which was the original dining hall uh, for the university. And, and if I get time, I'm gonna talk to you about that very elaborate ceiling in there and what we had to do to restore it. Uh, we've worked at the Boston Public Library, McKim Mead and White Building. We've done all the decoration there and a lot of the woodwork and, and mural conservation. Uh, and we're probably most known for our work at Grand Central Terminal, where we restored and conserved the ceiling over the main concourse of the building. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner of that photo is a little bit of our work, uh, one of my colleagues working away. So we're about some 140 feet up working above uh, the crowds, which is really cool. Uh, and we did work at Radio City Music Hall, uh, some 90,000 square feet of gilding and glazing and decorating. 
uh, just a monumental project for us. Uh, U.S. Capitol building, uh, th that's me to the lower right, um, uh, gilding away as well. Um, and if you've ever been to the National Building Museum in D.C., the columns there are quite incredible. I'm going to I'm going to show you a photo here. Um, here's another example of it. They are plaster and brick core. They're 75 foot tall shafts, 12 foot in diameter. So you get a sense of the scale with the people in the photo. And uh, the large photo here is us, uh, our crew decorating uh, to create a Sienna type marble, which was uh, originally installed in the 1890s and then years later obliterated. And then we, uh, of course, came back and put it back together properly. And we do a lot of church work. This is a cathedral in Connecticut. And if you notice the back wall on the left, there's nothing there. And the back wall on the right, you now see what appears to be stained glass. But that is actually not stained glass. That's a mural that we created using reflective material. And it was a cost savings option because they wanted to use stained glass there. But uh, looking at it and the value of it was over $2 million. So we created this 40-foot mural um, uh, to fill the space. Uh, so you can see we get around physically, but we also, in terms of our trades, we, we do all things uh, finishes, including the design of them. And we've also been featured in uh, a documentary co uh, uh, called Good Work, Masters of the Building Trades. It uh, was produced with the Smithsonian and uh, PBS, and it's fantastic. If you are into traditional trades like masonry, ironwork, stained glass, uh, uh, stone carving. They featured uh, these traditional tradesmen and they followed them around for some 10 years, including us. And we were the decorative painting studio that they followed. You can watch it online if you have time. It's fantastic. Um, and getting to know some of these characters and uh, the way they view buildings, view their craft uh, with such um, revere and um, respect, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, awesome to see. Uh, but here, let me get into this case study. Uh, this is the Maryland State House, the old Senate chamber, as it were. It was built in 1770s. Uh, I think it was completed in 1779. So it was during the revolution and the completion of the, the, the ending of the, of the war. Uh, so there's a lot of activity uh, going on in Maryland and of course, uh, Philadelphia. But this space, this old Senate chamber, was used uh, by our um, founding fathers uh, to assemble, uh, to debate. Um, so uh, uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and all the other characters of our history um, presided over uh, the, um, the treaty that took place with uh, England. And that took place in this room. Uh, so. Uh, over the years, the room had changed. It became a museum because they realized its importance around 1900. But during that period, they Victorianized it. Uh, they had all this high ornament and fabric, and it was nothing like its original, uh, as you can imagine, colonial design. So uh, the state decided, well, we're going to put the room back together again, uh, and we're going to put it back to uh, 1782 or 83, I think it is when George Washington resigned his post as commander of the Continental Army. Uh, of course, when he, design, he resigns, uh, that is the opening for him to become president, first president of the United States, and therefore setting up our republic and our democracy. Uh, so it's a really important moment. Uh, the state wanted to capture that moment uh, in this space. So you looking in the space now, the room is entirely gutted. As you can see, the only thing remaining is that niche. That niche is the only historic material, um, finished material that was left from uh, the 1780 period. So we use that, uh, that niche to study the plaster, to study the paints that were used, uh, and of course, to study the moldings and then replicate those moldings. Uh, we did, uh, through the archives, we found uh, some sketches and a 18, oh gosh, 1860s or so photo that was used to replicate the moldings, uh, plaster moldings and, and uh, even the woodwork. So we use that to rebuild the room, if you will. Um, one of the requirements of the project was to use the same or similar materials that were used in the 1700s. So they required that we used old fashioned lime plaster with animal hair. 
they required that the plaster be three coat plaster uh, and use a wood lath hand split. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some of that now. Um, and even the paintwork was required to use traditional paints, protein paints and old fashioned linseed oil paints. And you can even see in this photo to the right, uh, the hand split lath. It took us six months to find the uh, required uh, pine that they, uh, they wanted us to use. Uh, had to have a heart growth of 14 rings. So we were out in the Virginia Hills, uh, cutting down uh, trees that could meet the specification of the architect. Uh, so first things first, we um, uh, had to rebuild the ceiling. That was the only part of the project they allowed us to use modern materials because they wanted us to level the ceiling uh, from the structure above. And the only way really to do that and safely do that um, was to use Unistrut and um, uh, thread rod into the ceiling. And we have a perfect level ceiling that we ultimately uh, built our built off of. Uh, what right when once we had that framework, uh, we used self furring lath at the ceiling, and you could see in the photo uh, it's screwed in, and then some of that lath is uh, stitched together using tie wire. Uh, now we're starting to install the plaster. We have our first coat in, our scratch coat as it's known. Um, this here has a lot of aggregate, a lot of sand, if you will, uh, mixed with that old fashioned lime putty. Uh, the lime putty. Uh, as a matter of fact, was slaked for over a year. So lime, uh, after it's put in a kiln and dehydrated and becomes in a powder form, broken down and pulverized into a powder form, uh, we slake it, we, we, which means we add water to it again and we liquefy and we keep it slaked or liquefied, in this case, for over a year. We kept it in barrels for over a year. So uh, it has a high calcium content, which makes for a really good plaster really durable plaster and really great plaster to work with. And you can see uh, after the plaster is uh, applied, we score the plaster, um, scratch it as, as uh, so hence the term. And that gives us a key to put the next layer of plaster on. So here you kind of, now you're seeing a, a broader a view of that. And of course, we're working in sections, getting those layers up. Uh, and now we're putting the putty coat on. And that putty coat, is the finished coat, is a high um, content of lime and very little aggregate, um, and a fine aggregate at that, if any aggregate's used. Uh, so we're putting the lime putty on, and when we put it on, we, we put it on very thin, about 16th to an eighth of an inch thick, uh, and we lay it on, and then we walk, well, you can see uh, our mechanic here, Scott, uh, he has a little bit of plaster on his trowel, and he is, uh, he is running over the plaster with a wet mop. That is a felt mop uh, filled with water. And he puts that felt mop in front of his trowel and he is slicking the surface as we call it. And he's just, he just is pushing the plaster onto the surface very uh, with a lot of pressure. So he's really trying to compress the plaster and also smooth it out. So when it's complete, and you've seen, I'm sure all of you have seen smooth plaster, it's really glass smooth, uh, high compression. And that's uh, what he's trying to achieve here by slicking the surface with a felt mop uh, and trowel. Uh, here he's mixing that putty um, and we mix it in batches. Um, so that's a, a gauge as it's called, which is probably a couple, um, two five gallon pails worth of uh, plaster putty and it's mixed on a table. Uh, and uh, he just takes on some plaster and puts it on his hawk, which is that um, uh, square uh, shelf that he uses uh, as he's plastering. Uh, once that ceiling was done, we had to put the, the cornice back together or the entablature, actually the entire entablature uh, was part of the original design. Uh, so, uh, the, there are original metal brackets that were used. Uh, we kept, we used those on one of the elevations, but we copied those to make these L brackets or these bent brackets to hold up our entablature. So we used similar technology to, uh, again, to the uh, 1700s. So once those brackets were uh, bent and put in place, uh, we, you could see here in the photo, working our way from right to left, we have our wood furring. Uh, attached to the metal bracket. And that wood furring is used to, uh, 
uh, just as that, it's furring so that we can fasten our plaster to the wood. Uh, so it gives us something to fasten to. And you can see here, we you can see that whole relationship, the wood, the metal bracket, and then of course that plaster cornice, which is cast off site and then installed. And I'll, I'll get back to that here in a moment. Uh, we, modern technology, we're, we used laser levels. Um, uh, we use modern tools, of course, uh, when it came to the plaster, cutting tools, et cetera, but uh, traditional materials. So we're trying to be as perfect as we can. Um, I, I take some issue with this, uh, just from a philosophy, uh, philosophic point of view, like uh, the, the, there was high demands to have uh, really tight uh, tolerances for our work, but I'm quite um, confident to say that in the uh, uh, 1770s, they were not using lasers. Uh, they were probably using water uh, levels uh, and string lines and ma basic measuring tools. And they would have been fairly precise, but uh, probably not as precise as this, which um, I would prefer to just go about that method, but um, some of the, some of the, it was a little bit of conflict in terms of uh, the philosophies and these things. Here again, just showing another, we're building up that plaster, the entire entablature, working our way down. Again, you can see the furring and the uh, brackets. Uh, then we come down to the freeze, which is that flat plaster surface. Uh, and you can see the wood behind it that we're fastened to. So the way that is assembled, uh, this entablature, uh, at least for plaster, and I can't speak for uh, stone, but for plaster, we install the cornice first, then the architrave, which is the lower third. Uh, once those are level and square, then we fit in the freeze. So it comes in three sections. Um, sometimes the brackets that are in the cornice, those are cast separately, and, that, and, and in this case they were. And if you look way in the back corner at the corner of the room, you can see we do not have the brackets installed yet. So what we do there is we fill in everything and then we lay the brackets out so that there is kind of a, a symmetrical uh, balance in the room. Now, some of these, the bracket spaces may, uh, may not be exact between space. Uh, they may vary by half inch or quarter inch or even an inch. So we kind of step those out so there's uniformity, but uh, they're not necessarily exact. So the room gives it, tells us, how to lay it out and we lay it out accordingly. So David, I'm curious, I see what looks like little screw holes. Yep. Uh, and is that literally just like you're using um, like a drywall screw to yeah, secure much. the plaster to the wood? Yeah, so we do two things and I'm gonna show you, uh, I don't have a good photo of this, but we do two things and sometimes we do three things. Uh, we definitely screw our plaster, countersink our screws, uh, uh, in, in the plaster to the wood, and then we fill them in with plaster. We also glue it using construction adhesive. And the third thing we will do, especially on the cornice, we take plaster wads. Um, and I'm, I, basically a plaster wad is you take a, a loose slurry of plaster in a bucket and you add hemp to it um, or burlap. Uh, I prefer hemp because it uh, allows the plaster to knead into it. You can knead it all together. And you take this kind of very hairy plaster wad uh, and you put it, drape it behind the molding, but over uh, uh, over the metal frame or over the wood furring to the other side of the plaster. So you create a bridge, a hanger, and that's what they really are. They're hangers. So we use those, which are really traditional. They're really great. They, hold, they have an incredible tensile uh, strength. Um, and super hard. Uh, they, once they're, that plaster is cured or uh, hardened over a uh, course of a day, uh, you, those moldings will never move. So we do a lot of things and just because of modern availability of modern technology, we do these things. Uh, we also do it because everybody's so litigious that we end up doing two and three kind of redundancies because um, we don't want to end up in a courtroom. We don't, certainly don't want anyone to get hurt if these fall because uh, and I'm going to show you that in another project that we, we worked on where a large chunk of plaster fell uh, 10 foot wide, 10 foot long by three or four foot wide, probably um, 20 pounds per square foot and uh, destroyed a, a church pew seat. So um, we come across that kind of stuff, but we do a lot of redundancies. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, now, when we come into corners, you can see what we're doing here. So we we kind of lay out the uh, 
before we turn a corner, we kind of lay out the, the front runs and then we'll fill in that, that return uh, piece. And of, and of course, when we're cutting this plaster, you have to, uh, I think I may have a photo of this later, but when we cut plaster, we cut it upside down um, because it changes the profile. Um, and the depth of the cut is the depth of the plaster from the, the front edge of it to the bottom edge of it. So if that plaster cornice is, let's say, um, seven inches deep, well, our cut has to be seven inches from the edge to the bottom. And I'm not sure if I'm explaining this well, but um, it, it exa the, the, that, that miter joint exactly is the same depth or angle as the depth of the plaster itself uh, from the front to back. Um, so we end up cutting these upside down. If we cut them um, top side up, uh, it creates these weird curves and cuts. So when we cut plaster, we actually cut it upside down. And here we are filling it in. So we're just working it in. And with plaster, unlike wood, and, and I, I, I came across this on a project where um, the architect and project manager and owner's rep came into the room and they saw that my plaster corners and butt joints were not actually butted together. There's actually a gap and that's intended. Let me show you in the next photo. You see here, there are gaps here uh, at those seams. And I, the first time I, uh, I, I came across them that didn't understand it, wasn't familiar with it. And I was, you know, they were really, uh, they were kind of freaked out by the whole matter uh, because they were, one of them came from the carpentry field, cabinetry, and they thought everything, you know, has uh, different types of joints. Uh, butt joints and scarf joints, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I said, no, we, we don't do it that way. We we fill in the joints with plaster. And they didn't really, had no, well, they didn't get that at all. Freaked them out. They thought we were just going to kind of leave it like this with caulk or something, which would be no good. But what we have to do with plaster is um, if, if, the, if we just butt, butt joint it and just, and it's a little hairline and we try to fill it with plaster, that will pop out. So there's not enough meat, if you will, uh, to, to fill in. So you, you intentionally leave a gap. It could be a quarter inch. It could be a, an inch if you want it to be. The, the wider the gap, of course, the more hand tool work you have to do. So we try to keep it about a quarter inch, um, three eighths of an inch, something like that um, as rule of thumb. Uh, and what those all those seams have to be filled in by hand with a little uh, sculpting tool. And that's what we're doing here. You can actually see at the freeze uh, where those screw holes were, He's got the, the plaster is really wet, so it's darker. And you can see he's filling in the screw holes and he's filling in the seam at where the freeze meets the cornice uh, and that little uh, lamb's tongue molding. Uh, again, now we're now you see that in cornice uh, on the right side of the room is now becoming monolithic through all the tooling and fill work as versus the left side where you see that large joint. And also you see the joint where the cornice meets the ceiling. So that all gets filled in as part of the work. And there's a lot of effort in that, believe it or not. So uh, people see us throwing the moldings up, like, wow, these guys are going fast and they're, 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 it's really great, but boy, maybe we're spending a lot of money on these guys and they, uh, they, they, they're overcharging us. And then they, start, then they start seeing us tooling and how things start to slow down. And there's no good way of getting around that. You just have to get to it. Uh, you can see here the wood, uh, just as a point of note, because we're going to come to this next, the wood lath on the wall, the hand split wood lath. Uh, just some of the detail. These are our shop drawings uh, that we used, um, and there were uh, some of the drawings were one-to-one -one scale, um, but uh, we we're using this as a reference to lay out on those swags, the rosettes, and those urns. The swags were uh, on a string, um, so they were kind of like uh, like a piece of jewelry. So we had to get it in place, uh, screw them in, and glue them in. Uh, so that was quite interesting to lay that all out. And here you go. The urn is in place, half the swag is in. We kind of did a dry run on this and it was a mock-up, uh, but you could see that we're working that in. If you notice above and below and around, you, you see no seams, they're all monolithic now. Um, and so the rosette is installed, the urn is installed, and then we fill in. It's, it's constantly kind of work the outside edges uh, or outside ornaments and then fill in. So we get uh, symmetry and here you go. Now let me take you to the, the wood lath on the wall. So you can see um, the wood lath is um, applied to 
the white furring behind it. That white furring was installed and painted uh, for weather purposes. And then uh, our hand split um, wood lath um, was installed, um, which is really tricky installing hand split wood lath, uh, just because it's not uh, it's not ripped um, or sawn lath that is, you know, very, um, uh, the sizes are all uniform and you can go from there. This is a lot trickier to deal with. Uh, by the way, when a plaster is installing wood lath, um, when they install it, um, it, uh, it should be wetted. We, we bathe our lath in um, a, a, a pail or a, a bath of water overnight uh, so that it swells, uh, it, it accepting the water, and it's hydrated. Uh, so when we, and then if, if, it, if it's installed and then not plastered right away. We re-wet that plaster, that, that lath, excuse me, using spritz bottles or uh, Hudson sprayers and things like that. And then we immediately plaster. And we do that so that the, the wood does not suck uh, up all the moisture out of the plaster. So it doesn't, it doesn't prematurely dry out the plaster. That's really important because if it, if, if it uh, wicks away the, pla uh, the water from the plaster, the plaster will be weakened. It will shrink uh, too quickly, and it will start cracking. Um, the cracks may not be a problem, but they they they, they very much may be a big problem. Uh, minor fracturing, hairline cracks are kind of typical in plaster as it dries, but um, it can be a problem if it's not dealt with properly in terms of pre-treating your lath. Uh, just uh, some of the details we're working on. Uh, now we're starting to plaster the. Uh, the walls, just like we did the ceiling, we, we trawled on that first layer uh, and making sure we're pushing it into the to the lath so that the plaster goes between the lath and forms a curl of plaster, uh, creating what is known as a key or lug. Uh, so we try to key the plaster uh, to the lath because, again, this is a hanging system, albeit vertical. Plaster does not stick to wood. Uh, they are not like materials. Plaster does not have adhesive in it. So when this plaster dries, it will expand and contract separately from the wood. Uh, so it's important that um, uh, that those keys are built properly and, and with the animal hair, or we also use wood fiber uh, uh, as well, uh, but that is strong and uh, can handle the movement of the uh, materials. Just a so detail. A, yeah. a quick question on that and that process when you're doing a three-part plaster or two-part and you've got that first coat how do you know if the plaster is uh you know not enough too much i you know i don't see any tracks along the side or anything like that where the plasterer can help to gauge yeah, when he or she has the right depth. Is that just something that you learn from years of doing? Yeah, you do learn. Um, yes, and you you, you should um, have a good mechanic, a good tra uh, journeyman, if you will. Uh, and if you're being apprenticed properly, you will learn this. You will learn uh, how to push it in. You will learn also how much. You, so you have a hawk of plaster, and you you'll know how much square footage you should be putting on that first coat. So you know you're not so you're not spreading out too thin, you know. Um, uh, so you have to. It, it is a feel. You're also um, you literally can hear um, when you're pushing the plaster on. Sometimes you're putting enough uh, so much on that the plaster falls through and hits the floor on the back side of the wall. So you can literally hear that dropping. Those. So you'll you'll hear things. You'll see things. You can uh, you can look to the side to see if they're curling. Um, you could look. Between the lath a little bit, but you're you're right. Most of it is based on uh, experience and understanding, and we see a lot of the work we do is, it, frankly, is because the original installations do not have enough plaster keys. And I'll show you that later when we have time. I'm gonna, I really okay. want to come back to that because I know that that's really important because that's dealing with more times than not we're dealing with um, re repairing plaster. Um, and stabilizing plaster as a collective, all of us here probably in this seminar versus new plaster. But uh, anyhow, this covers a lot of you know the the rationale of what's going on and, and why it's how it's built and so forth. Um, now we've put the second coat of plaster on the uh, the um, the brown coat and we've scratched it in uh, to create a key, just like we did on the ceiling. And now we're putting again that finished coat, pushing it on.
trawling on, leveling it off, compressing it. Um, because we were using uh, old fashioned lime, we had to wet the walls. If you're using modern plaster, like, uh, uh, I don't know, like uh, USG products, uh, Imperial base coat or um, um, diamond or uh, structolite or any of these kind of modern plasters, they're gypsum based and they do not need to be wetted after they're applied. So they just need to cure um, whatever is required by the manufacturer. But with old fashioned lime, we have to every day uh, wet the, the surface, spritz it down with a, a sprayer. So when the first coat was put on, we waited, uh, I think, nine or 10 days before we put that second application on. And then we put second application on, we let that cure down a little bit and waited eight or nine days again. And then the finished coat, we waited probably 10 or 15 days and that was wetted down. So every day we have to wet down the plastic that we installed um, and, and keep moving. So we have to keep schedule that and pay attention to that. The reason being is um, unlike gypsum plaster, lime plaster cures through oxidization and uh, it gets really hard over time so it carbonates and so it really needs a lot of air but but it needs to stay hydrated so that it can oxidize uh slowly and uh lime plaster takes months if not a, up to a year to cure i don't mean dry i mean cure and harden um so if i take that go to that plaster wall uh, maybe three days after it's plastered and looks dry and i didn't do anything with uh water I would touch the surface and it'll feel hard. But if I start scratching it with my finger now, I, I can open that up, that skin, and get into this soft plaster that becomes powder. So it really does need time to cure. Uh, it needs to be wetted regularly, uh, not soaked, but just wetted. Um, and, and a lot of care needs to be taken, uh, considered for this. Now, so you probably say, well, what, why would we do this? Well, we today, we use less and less of this material. We've opted for uh, gypsum plaster, and now we've even opted, of course, for drywall. Uh, because we use gypsum because it's faster. Uh, material costs are the same. The installation is very similar, except other than the wetting. Um, so they behave similarly when they're applied, but gypsum cures faster. We need about anywhere from 10 to 21 days, typically to cure. So you could paint right after, uh, within 21 days of painting, whereas, um, Lime plaster, you typically can't paint unless you're using a protein paint. Uh, you certainly can't use oils. Oils will will um, uh, peel off and there'll be they'll, all sorts of problems. So, um, but the nice thing about lime, uh, the beauty of lime plaster um, is that it's vapor permeable uh, all the way through. So if you have a wood building or a brick building, uh, it is a completely vapor permeable system. Uh, if it left raw and if it's painted with a protein paint uh, or a uh, potassium silicate type paint, the system remains vapor permeable. So the walls here, after just as a footnote, after we plastered the walls, canning was also required to do the paint work. And we were required to make our own paint. And we used a protein paint called distemper, um, which is uh, rabbit skin glue is the binder as opposed to acrylic oil. And rabbit skin glue uh, is vapor permeable. We used pigments and water and rabbit skin glue, and we made our own paint and we applied it. So that wall is completely vapor permeable today. And that's what they're after. I'm going to move into the ornament now. So now the walls are, the, the, uh, it's all raw plaster now, and uh, we're letting it cure. Um, and this is kind of the finished product of the plaster. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more details of that balcony which is a combination of wood and plaster. Uh, here's the room, another angle. The floor is not yet installed. Uh, most of our plaster work's done. The paint work's not done and the wood trim is not installed yet. This is a very interesting uh, detail here. This uh, entablature is made of plaster. The column below it uh, is wood and the railing system above it is also wood. So we have this flat plaster uh, with this, um, a, a protrusion of the plaster above the capital, uh, and then we have the curved plaster. All really tricky stuff, a lot of details. Uh, so you can see the wood framing behind it. Uh, our plaster, the straight plaster was uh, applied in, uh, in its parts very much like the entablature, and then we have the curve. Now how the curved plaster is manufactured is really important. Um, 
So how the curve plaster is made, we take rubber molds uh, of, of that flat plaster or that straight plaster. Uh, and the rubber, because it's, it is rubber, it's flexible. We can make a saddle or a bench, if you will, that has the arc that's required. Uh, so we, once we understand the radius, we uh, take a uh, luon uh, and build a, a table, a saddle, and then put the rubber mold in that, lay it in that saddle, whatever that arc is. And then once that's in there, we pour our wet plaster, uh, molding plaster into that um, mold, rubber mold. And then uh, once it's dry, we uh, demold it and we have a curve. Um, and I'll show you another example of that. You can see it here. Um, uh, in the, in the mid ground there, you can see that curve. So that will key right into the surface. Uh, we also do um, run moldings in place. Uh, this project, we didn't have to run moldings in place, but I just want to share that with you. Uh, and it's a little quick video of how a plaster molds and run in place. Um, we uh, actually, I don't have a good picture of this, but I'm going to, I'll talk about it here. We have a piece of sheet metal that we, we cut with snips to match the profile of the molding. Uh, and I'm going to show that again to you. Uh, we take snips and we make a, a horse or a mule. And we have the, that uh, simple piece of two by as a rail. Uh, and we fill in the plaster and we uh, ride along that rail. And we keep building up the plaster, as you see here, uh, and repeat the process until it's completely filled in. So, and once it's filled in, we can make more of these, or uh, we can make, make a rubber mold of this and then cast the other lengths. So we have options here. Uh, more times than not, we will make the profile, the single profile like we did here in plaster, make a mold of that. And then if we have to make, you know, 500 linear feet or a thousand linear feet, it's much easier to do it in uh, making a casting of it, making it out of castings as opposed to running on a bench as is here. Of course, these are some of the ornaments back to the, the, the project. Uh, these are uh, were made hand uh, carved in clay, uh, and then uh, in some, a little bit of wood as well, as you can see in the urn. But hand carved, built up. Uh, once it's the model's made, then a rubber mold is made of that, of course. Uh, and then a plaster casting is made of that. We can use other casting materials, resins and so forth. Uh, uh, and then we make a bunch of our copies, as you'll see in the next slide. Here we go. And so that's our stock that we're using uh, for the project. More of our parts. So you can see those brackets. And you can see the top photo. Um, when we have a pediment, uh, like we did at that balcony, there's a center pediment. Uh, we have the brackets in that pediment. Those brackets have to be um, carved and cast on a curve or on an angle. I should say not a curve, but on an angle. Uh, and I'll show, hopefully I have a photo of that, I just don't recall. And some of our details laid in. You can see our uh, our name. We, we we try to quietly put our name. <laughs> Individuals that have worked on projects, uh, tuck them away in buildings. Uh, and here is one of our guys, Eddie, he's tooling in. You can see the seams are still there. Um, and uh, even at, uh, there's a hole in between the bracket. Um, where they, we key in that little rosette. So it's even keyed together. Uh, here's us uh, uh, at the end of the project. So there's that pediment behind us, more importantly. And you can see the brackets, they're on an angle. Um, so uh, going up the pediment. And of course, the horizontal one are straight brackets. Uh, so we had we have brackets, three different types of brackets there. We have a left bracket, on the angle, a right bracket for the other angle, opposing angle, and then of course the bracket for the straight horizontal run. So just in that, there's three different brackets. Of course, you have your um, uh, oak leaf, um, embricated oak leaf molding, uh, then all those profile moldings, uh, of course the capitals and so forth. So a lot of components. And looking at the back wall, you see that uh, distemper paint. And uh, those brushes we used, are legit brushes. They're six inch brushes and seven inch brushes. Um, why brushes to apply distemper paint? And uh, I'm the guy in the middle. Um, so uh, it was quite fun to actually work on that project. 
so here's just some completed details of the room um, with the color and the wood in place. The wood, by the way, we used an old-fashioned linseed oil that we had to make as well because uh, they weren't making paint in the 1790s at Home Depot yet, at our uh, bedroom more. So paint was made on site, and uh, we did something similar using linseed oil and uh, Japan dryers and uh, mineral spirits and uh, ground pigment to make our paint. Uh, just some of the details. So you see that pediment again on the opposite side of the entrance of the space. I'm going to go on to the next project and kind of a little bit of patching now. Any questions about this or should I move on? Uh, yeah, go ahead and move on. Sure. Okay, so the Cosmos Club is in Washington, D.C. This is a ballroom which was originally a residence uh, for a wealthy family in D.C. They were trying to marry off their daughter to an Englishman. And they thought the best way to get a suitor, uh, a notable suitor, they would uh, build a ballroom. So they had Carrera and Hastings, if you know who Carrera and Hastings are. Uh, they're an incredible architectural firm of the early 20th century, uh, prolific, uh, and they uh, built this room. Uh, this room did not look like it when we got in there. Our company is responsible for the entire room. So if we restored the parquet floor, the, the walls, the ornament, plaster ornament on the walls, the wood paneling or uh, uh, boiserie, a French term, and the ormolu. Uh, the plaster, the ceiling is uh, from the cove up, is entirely plaster. Uh, and it, and it, all the artwork is done on canvas, which we are responsible for as well. Uh, I'm gonna take you to um, skip past this and some of the things that we did. It's not, I don't think, really important. I'm gonna focus in on this inside this perforated line. That large coffered section uh, has this incredible chandelier. And if you notice, uh, they, uh, there's an air conditioning vent there that was installed in the 1950s. Uh, the, the chandelier is original to the room, uh, but uh, modified uh, to accommodate that air conditioning vent. Unfortunately, uh, in the 1950s, it puts the air conditioning unit right on the ceiling joists. Uh, so you can imagine a five ton unit on that joist, on those joists, uh, no platform, no nothing. Uh, uh, so it it dripped condensation, causing problems, uh, vibration of the unit, um, the weight of the unit caused uh, the plaster, that very ornate plaster coffer ceiling to separate uh, and to come degrade, degrade it from uh, all those issues. Uh, so um, next photo may, may not tell the whole story, but if you can tell there's a bow there, right in the middle of that whole thing. Uh, and there's a lot of plaster cracking that we were dealing with um, uh, and it was really uh, problematic. And you could see some of the ornament, you can actually see hairline cracks through the ornament that have been glued back up over time. They tried cosmetic things, but uh, it really had to address the air conditioning unit and really get it out of the space. But we took a close examination. This is what we found. Uh, what we're looking at is the joists of wood up top of the furring below it, which is completely separated. That's how far the furring was separated from this, the joist the, to the point that uh, uh, a penny uh, nail, uh, looks like about a three inch nail was separated from the joist. Uh, and you could see the plaster to the left and below the furring. So how this was originally assembled, you had the ceiling joist, uh, you had the furring going perpendicular, the one by three. And then underneath that, the metal lath would have been uh, fastened to the wood furring. And then that three coat plaster would have been applied as we talked about uh, in the other project very similarly. And then the ornament would have been applied to that, uh, glued to it using plaster, using plaster. Literally, they use plaster as a glue when you're plaster to plaster, it's kind of a glue. Uh, and so that all just came away. So it was decided uh, that we had to cut out the, a good chunk of that ceiling uh, and, and put it back uh, in place on the same plane. Uh, so we demoed that. We went to the other end of the room and made a rubber mold uh, of one half of the ornament there. Uh, and therefore we were able to make, eventually make two copies to fill in the space. Uh, we have the blue, the rubber is, uh, we used in the rubber, you can color it each layer. So we, we have three layers of rubber um, applied one after another. Each layer has a different color. So we visually see that we have a full uh, coating, a nice buildup of rubber mold. And um, the next photo is our mother shell or hard shell. So once that rubber is put on, we take plaster and reinforce. You can see the skeleton there. 
uh, we put plaster, wet plaster and hemp mixed together, those wads, we plaster right onto that rubber mold and, and put uh, some framework ribbing in it and create a shell. Uh, once that shell is dry, we take that down as we're doing here. Uh, it's a bed, it acts as a bed. And then we take the rubber mold and dr drop that in and it creates a sat this kind of shell or saddle where the rubber mold won't move because the rubber mold is very floppy and flexible when it's taken off the ceiling. So in order to keep it rigid, we have to make this shell. And now we're, we, you can see uh, from top left, uh, we have the shell, we, we have the rubber mold, uh, and on, in the rubber mold, he's applying white plaster material, uh, molding plaster. We use, um, simply use USG molding plaster or hydrocal. Um, sometimes you, we use pottery plaster because uh, it's a little bit softer, we could carve with that. Uh, the photo in the middle, um, he's reinforcing the plaster using hemp. Uh, he's laying the hemp out. And then the photo to the upper right, he's actually pouring plaster on the hemp uh, to create a sandwich between the, the plaster that's in the mold and then um, uh, the plaster that's being applied on top of it. So it's, it's probably about uh, three quarters to an inch thick. And he, you can see he's working his way in the lower left. And then the, the plaster casting on the right, the finished piece. We're taking these pieces and we're gonna install them up into the ceiling as we are here. So um, like they did originally, we filled, we put new lath in, we put the two coats of plaster in, and you can see it's gray there. And then we stick the thin um, three quarter inch or so ornamental plaster to that. Uh, and we used plaster, uh, thin set plaster and uh, as a glue, and we set the whole thing in place. Uh, once it's set in place, then we uh, take finished plaster over the grayed area of plaster and smooth that out to a nice, neat, smooth plaster. And once again, the, the ceiling becomes monolithic. And here's just some of our details. And here it is finished. So we put it back together again. This, of course, the chandelier is not placed, but that's exactly what was done. And here's the finished product right here. I'm going to move into another subject, if that's okay. Yeah, great. I I wish I could hear all the oohs and ahs that have been happening during the course oh, of this. Oh, you know, I don't know how. Yeah, I feel like I'm going to vacuum a little bit, so <laughs> that's good to hear. These, I, for all these I know, are I'm, some amazing pictures, I gotta say. Oh, cool. Oh, good. I thanks a lot. It gives me motivation here. I'm going to move into an next year plastering project, which you may come across in your 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 work at some point. So I'm gonna go quickly through this one, keep it brief. This is a court, um, a library in Connecticut, Ferguson Library, uh, neoclassical, of course. Um, you'll see here, uh, this is a finished photo, but I, I'm using it as a, a, a lining up the rest of the job. That plaster capital in the perforated line and those brackets up there, uh, or modillions, if you want, want to call them that, um, those are cast in plaster. Uh, which we have seen, um, I've done work at Yale and other courthouses around Connecticut that have cast plaster ornament. Um, they did this as a value engineering, I suppose, to stone um, or marble, uh, or I guess even cast stone. Uh, they, they uh, you know, I, I, this is not the best use of plaster, frankly. Um, when they, cast this in plaster as they did here, they would typically dip the plaster in a vat of oil uh, or at the very least um, soak it and, 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 and really put a heavy coating of linseed oil uh, in there or uh, yeah, linseed oil is really thinned down so that it becomes um, vapor permeable, uh, not vapor permeable, becomes solid, uh, trying to uh, resist mo uh, moisture. It won't uh, completely prevent moisture, but it will resist it for a long period of time. But again, weathering and uh, UV effect will, will take hold on this uh, and degrade that plaster over time. So it's not the best use of material, um, but that's what was, uh, was there and that's what they wanted to put back. So when we approach the project, uh, you can see the brackets. Um, they stripped them uh, and actually they didn't realize they're plaster, the contractor nor the architect and they came across this and realized they were done in plaster. So uh, they're really bad shape. Um, uh, and I'll show you the capital. Uh, here's the capital, you can see a lot of the erosion. 
And uh, oh wait, let me take you back one slide. I, I apologize. Uh, I, I skipped over that plaster um, relic there to the right in front of the truck. Uh, well, that was one of our models, uh, unfortunately. So we had to kind of work with that and fix that one and fix a part of another one and kind of cobble things together uh, to make a model. And once we made a model, we were able to make our molds, which I'll show you here. So we have our rubber mold. We do it in half. We only need to make a half of a mold of a, uh, in this case, a half of a model. Sometimes we do quarters. It depends on uh, what's required. Um, and you, you can see we have our rubber mold. And behind that, you can see a little bit of the, especially the photo on the right, you can see the profile of the, the rubber, pink rubber, and behind it, that shell we made to keep the rubber rigid. And now we're using plaster. We're, we're instead of using uh, hemp or burlap or some Haitian um, material, uh, grass, if you will, uh, we're using uh, fiberglass, uh, which is more suitable for exterior. Um, and we're using exterior grade plaster, but still it's not great. Um, but this is what they wanted and this is what we did. So um, we did during this project really dredge, uh, and here's our casting process, um, really soak the, um, the plaster in linseed oil uh, to protect it. Uh, here's some of the pieces. Actually, the one on the right, I think, is from another project. The one on the left is our project. But you can see the two halves. Uh, they will be installed on site later. Uh, they're screwed in. They're wadded in. They're tie and we use tie wire, too. So we have some anchors that we anchor in from the backside on one half. Uh, and then the other half will we'll have long tie wires, enough to get our hands in there. And uh, it won't make it really tight. But if the plaster came loose, it will only sort of like a a safety harness will drop maybe three inches. It won't fall completely. It may fall out of place, but that's about it. Um, so we use con uh, construction adhesive, uh, screws, and tie wire. And uh, here, here it is here, just getting ready for that assembly. And of course, the finished product back to that. So again, you may come across this, and uh, uh, now you'll know what to do with that one. Now, uh, I'm going to get into plaster consolidation. Uh, in using adhesives and, and uh, um, acrylics and, and when plaster is powdery on ceilings and cracking and delaminating, um, what do we do with that? Uh, do we just take it down and rip it out? Do we laminate drywall over it? Um, do, do we just ignore it, So, which we, we can't do for too long? But there are options, and sometimes uh, the best option is to keep what we have and stabilize it. It's, uh, it's cheaper than putting scaffolding up oftentimes. Uh, and demolishing an entire ceiling and then rebuilding it. Uh, and it's, it's cheaper than putting that scaffolding up again and putting drywall up and then having to tape and whatever you're going to do, a level five finish and so on and so forth. So there's arguments to save it, especially in historic preservation, uh, we may be required to. So this is a great method that's been around since the 1960s. And I'm, let's show you that. So um, uh, in this photo here, you have your some of your standard kind of uh, hanger systems. We showed you the metal lath uh, at the uh, courthouse. The one that's really interesting is the is the one down low, which is a plaster hanger, where I use plaster and hemp intermixed again, and we create these plaster hangers over wood. And you can see it kind of mushrooms out to the backside of the plaster on the ceiling. I'm going to show you more details of that. But that's a hanger uh, made of plaster, albeit. Uh, but when you have good sound plaster, this is what a profile should look of, of uh, three coat plaster on a ceiling or wall. And we talked about this and you asked that question about, you know, knowing if the keys are good and if they make this mushroom effect or kind of a, a curled effect. Um, you should see this. Uh, this is what it should see, be. And it often it is originally. But then over time, we, we oh, here's another uh, kind of detail. Sorry. You have your plaster key, your scratch coat, your first coat, your brown coat, and then your white coat. Your brown coat. Your, your brown coat is kind of a smoothing out or leveling coat. It doesn't have to be smooth in texture, but level. Uh, and, and, and it prepares you to receive the, the final coat, the white coat, which is oftentimes it could be sand float finish, uh, or it could be a neat plaster, as we showed you, slick trowel and the other project. Uh, but that's usually what you get. Um, but we, and here's it in profile, uh, those plaster keys or lugs. This is typically what we see. And you notice that the plaster uh, in the photo here, right in the middle of the plaster, it says gap between plaster and lath. Well, that's meant to be. Um, that's because the plaster does, is not glue 
It does not glue to, to the wood, so uh, it does not bond. Um, so you're gonna have a little bit of a space. Uh, and this is an example of what it looks great, plaster looks like in the backside. Those wonderful keys, when you see that, you know those plasters were doing the job and paying attention. Uh, but oftentimes when we come to a job where the plaster is well over 100 years old, uh, it's been affected by condensation and weathering and um, environmental conditions, uh, building movement, the plaster uh, lath framing going in different directions and the plaster doing its thing. We also know that gravity has a huge effect on plaster over time, so the keys start breaking. We also know that sometimes those plaster keys aren't completely filled in as we talked about when you, you asked that question. So when plaster keys don't go over the top, uh, they start breaking and separating and delaminating at different layers of the plaster profile or section. Uh, here you go again. Um, so I'm going to show you a, kind of a, this is a typical meeting house we see in New England, a uh, congregational church um, uh, where the, it looks good, looks sound, but you'll see in uh, a section of the plaster at the inner cornice, uh, molding uh, to the left behind the light pendant, um, the plaster fell there and it fell right on a pew uh, and destroyed the seat of the pew, oak pew, by the way. So oak seat was totally damaged. Um, and this is what ended up happening. Um, now you could, you see that that's about 10 foot long. It, it doesn't appear to be in scale, but it is uh, a good 10, 11 feet long um, and it is super heavy. And you could see the waviness in the plaster and the ceiling. Um, and you think, okay, well, it's an old building. It's 180 years old. This is to be expected. But uh, these are telltale signs. Uh, and eventually the plaster gives away. Now, if you look at the inner cornice, you could see those butt joints that were once filled in nice, like I showed you. Now they're separating. Uh, and there's space there because uh, things are falling out of plane. So that's another telltale sign visually that plaster uh, is you know, potentially problematic. Uh, here's some close up of that. We've probably all seen this kind of condition. So it's not just peeling paint here, it's plaster separation at joints at, uh, at, at the structure above. And we've seen here uh, at this inner cornice, another section where it's literally pulling off the ceiling, which is really scary. Uh, that's ready to go. As a matter of fact, that fell. When we got up, we put the dance floor scaffolding up. We started um, stabilizing the ceiling, and this section of plaster was at the other end of the room and fell um, overnight. Uh, it was, thank God, it fell overnight because we were working, uh, but it did fall. So even as we work, this stuff is uh, dangerous to deal with. So when we get up into the attic, this is what we saw. Uh, we saw a lot of dust um, behind, above the keys and above the lath, and the white powder is plaster. So I ran my hands across the keys of the plaster and it should be really hard like cement. And they were powder when I touched them. So they have the appearance of keys, but they're nothing more than just powder. So like, like sort of like sandcastle, like you make a sandcastle and if you rub your hand across it, it's just gonna collapse. Well, that's what these keys appear to be. Uh, they look like plaster keys, but they're nothing more than built up powder. Uh, and that's why you have all that dust. The plaster, as it's uh, degrading, uh, it is it's forming dust on the surface. And so I was like, oh my goodness, this is really bad. And so we went in and did a study. We, we peeled back the insulation. And you could see on the right, keys are completely missing. You also see that there's staining from what woods, uh, water staining or animal staining, honestly, uh, rodents. Uh, there's all sorts of, it's a mess up there, and uh, droppings of all sorts of animals. Um, so it's really in bad shape. Um, uh, in some areas, the keys are completely gone. Uh, you could literally see the plaster behind, below it, no keys whatsoever. So the plaster is in suspension, and the only thing holding it up is itself, um, and the plaster next to it uh, is keeping it from falling um, at this point. Uh, and here it is. And what we also found is that the furring is starting to separate. Uh, oh. uh, sorry. Well, I was just going to ask, so as you're looking at that and you're investigating it, are you coming to the conclusion that that plaster has been wetted and re-wetted over the course of decades or even centuries and that constant 
moisture infiltration is causing the plaster to separate back into its aggregate parts? Yeah, it is. It's separate. It's 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 happening because of that. It's co general kind of moisture and condensation of the attic space. Um, it's a change seasonal changes which causes the wood to expand and contract and is rubbing the plaster, if you will, if you can imagine that at a micro level. So it's slowly breaking down. Uh, also, uh, traumatic you know uh, events of water you know intrusion, direct water intrusion from a leaky roof is contributing to this um, as well. Uh, gravity is also taking its hold. Sometimes the plaster mix, uh, quite frankly, the plasters, um, the mechanic, individual mechanic, or the person making the plaster had too much of a of a rich mix, too much aggregate or not enough aggregate. Um, so it's really you really got to know your stuff. And we saw we see a lot of times we're um, repairing plaster because the original mechanics from the 1800s or not early 1900s um, didn't install it properly. So. Um, um, yeah, so they, they didn't have the specifications we had. They had the knowledge, but sometimes, you know, the old world recipes, um, if it wasn't, you know, ingrained in somebody, they may have missed it. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, yeah, so to, your, to answer your question, yes, your, your question is, that is based you on know, all that, that brings up a fascinating point, because say if you have a tax credit project, uh, you know, one of the cardinal sins under the standards for rehab is that if you have existing plaster that uh, you're not supposed to remove the plaster um, and still be within the uh, rehab guidelines yeah but like have you ever had to go to a preservation office and say i know this is original plaster or you know whatever the building component might be but it was it was designed or installed in such a faulty way that there even though it's historic it's not there's no way that you can feasibly preserve it or or is uh, there always a solution <laughs> there, there, uh, that's a great, well we've gone to them to explain these things but there more times than not there's a solution um, and we have the solution in this case, we have a couple of solutions. So we can't preserve the plaster by using consolidants and harden, we can harden the plaster from above. And I'm gonna show you that. Uh, so it can't be preserved. Uh, we change the uh, chemical makeup of the plaster, which they need to understand that because we're gonna inject acrylics into uh, a plaster material. So it's no longer purely plaster. It's no longer vapor permeable. Uh, it is now something new. It looks like plaster. Um, but it's not in, we're, you know, we're, we're preserving, if you will, we're more, more, I'd say more accurately, we're retaining. Um, uh, so if we're preserving it, we've changed its state. So it's not exactly the same, but, uh, usually it always, and I've never seen a, an issue where it doesn't meet, uh, you know, SHPO standards and they give us a hard time. They're actually grateful that we have a solution, frankly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, having yeah. That, yeah, so I'm going to. Okay, great. Yeah, so what we do is we get up into an attic and we realize, okay, we got to deal with this. We got to consolidate this. First thing we do is we vacuum the entire attic up. And you can see out of in that whole photo, there's only one plaster key left in the left, far left. All the keys have been, they're gone. They just broke down. It's the, you know, they just became the components, as you, as you well put it, um, individual. And so that's all sand that I'm vacuuming up. It's crazy. In, in gypsum or, or lime, lime, uh, components. Uh, so we vacuum that up. Oh, let me, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, so we're so here, we're, we're just, we're the, the, the this is another building, but we're, the, we're just popping the keys off that are weak and, and broken and so forth. And we just take a little tool and they just pop right off. And so we're doing that here. But what we do is, um, like those other photos, we're going to fill those voids now where the keys are, are missing and where that dark cracks are and the the drop of the plaster from the lath, uh, we're going to fill that in using consolidants. And we use uh, a couple of components and we we literally spray, we take uh, this acrylic um, polymer uh, and we soak the plaster. I mean, we soak it um, all the way to, to the point where it, it really gets to the paint almost. Uh, so we're now changing the chemistry of it, but we're hardening it and it, in, with that acrylic, it is a glue, uh, if you will. Uh, and we, we spray it down um, and we chain, we, we spray it down. The first coat is really thin 
thin down with water, this acrylic polymer. Um, and then we do a kind of a, a medium viscosity and then a thick viscosity to build it up. And we do three or four passes of that to the point where the green is the consolidant now, if you will. Okay. And we fill that all the way in. And we spray it right over the wood. We spray it over everything. Uh, so it acts as a preservative to the wood. I'm going to show you a completed product of that product. And then the last thing we do is we, after that's consolidated and hardened, we fill in the the uh, the keys. We make new keys, and we use an acrylic filler like a caulk that has aggregate in it as well. And it's super strong. It will glue to the wood. It will glue to the plaster, uh, and it will create a key effect. Here we are. We're um, Let's see, do I have? Yeah, we're spraying it on. Uh, and now I have a little video of that. And like, you just see how we're soaking it up. And we're just and we're just keep going over and going over and going over it. And we'll come back to this two more times doing this, at least. And then we go in there, we take this material and we fill in the, the, uh, the keys again. Uh, they don't need to lop over because now it's, it does, it's not hanging like the old keys hung. They, they're now really um, filling in and gluing in and changing the, um, the, uh, the uh, balance of, of, of strength and uh, weight and distribution of weight. So here's a completed uh, version of that. So, uh, we soak it so much that the acrylic polymer becomes like a gloss varnish because um, acrylics are glossy typically when they're uh, clear acrylics when they're dry. Uh, so uh, you can see this here. We end up um, uh, putting uh, some LVLs in as well. And um, we also put in some corner brackets. And here it is. It's sort of like the inside of a ship now. If one wanted to, you could literally stand on the lath, um, which I've done. I demonstrated this to a priest one time, um, but uh, it's like the inside of a ship. And it is, this will last now, I couldn't even tell you, definitely. Now this, this that's the beauty of it. This ceiling will last, you know, as far as I'm concerned, forever, uh, as long as they you know keep it weather tight. Um, but 150 years from now, it should be in good shape. Well, David, we are at about uh, 20 after, oh, so good. we have about 10 minutes. Yep. And um, I also want to encourage folks with uh, questions to keep asking them. Um, but uh, just know that uh, we're beginning to approach our 2.30 time. Yeah, I will. Um, I was going to get to another uh, demonstration here, but I think I will skip that. I, I will tell uh, you know what, I'm going to go to UVA here. I'm gonna just show you a couple of quick slides of a room, the dining room, which was uh, the building completely shifted out of plumb and level. And uh, this is where we're dealing with, that's a plaster um, uh, material. Look how off the walls are, just completely out of level and plumb, uh, which caused all sorts of deflection to the plaster ceiling and cornice and, and beams. Uh, look at this. This is crazy. Absolutely, every time I see this, I can't believe how much that plaster shifted. So what we learned was that uh, they try to do things like uh, take tie wire, uh, hold the ceiling up, which eventually uh, loosened up. Um, we found that the, like the other project, wood firming was separating uh, and all sorts of issues. So um, the, look at all the tie wire is just completely undone. It's, it's useless now. Uh, this is the uh, looking up into the uh, beam, uh, the photo down in the bottom right. We're looking up into the beam. We cut a hole in the plaster, looked up into it, and that's the furring we, we saw. That's the framing. We couldn't make heads or tails of the framing. It was insane. So uh, trying to uh, uh, figure all that out was crazy, but uh, there it is. So we cut a hole into that beam, and that's what we looked up into. I, I don't know what they were thinking. So they're talking about old world craftsmanship. Um, sometimes I kind of laugh when I when I hear that because 
Um, there's there's no specification here. There's no there's no drawing here. The, there's obviously the architect, uh, which was McKim, Mead, and White, by the way. Uh, they left it to the builder to uh, take their designs and build it the way they saw fit, as long as it looked good. So um, that's what we dealt with. I'm going to skip over some of these slides, so forgive me. Uh, well, I'm going to show you. Oh, that's the plaster wadi. Uh, we this is um, here where we take hemp and we make plaster wads. So we have hemp and, and loose plaster and we make those wads. And we, we use them, as I talked about, we drape it over the wood onto the back of the plaster, as you see in this uh, uh, diagram that we made. But I really want to show you something here, and then I'm going to break away. Um, I'm going to skip this, even though it's really important, but I'm going to skip it just because of time. This beam here, which had all that crazy woodwork above it, furring, we had, a we had to uh, put a glass partition underneath it. And they wanted the glass to go into the plaster uh, beam. So the, and uh, they, we had a Kenny had a, was responsible for the framework, which was going to be steel. So we we saw how bad that beam was deflecting, and you saw that crazy photo. So we thought the only way we could deal with this and try to make this whole thing work is to take the plaster apart. So we did that. We built these wood uh, tables uh, to to rest the plaster on. We cut the freeze out, which is flat. So we sacrificed that. And we left, we're left with the, the architrave at the bottom, the scrolls and the cornice above. Uh, once we took it out, we cut all that fur, crazy furring out. We disconnected everything. We put rebar in as a reinforcement. And so we can handle the, the architrave so it doesn't collapse. Uh, and we, can, and we, we disassembled that entire uh, beam. We put steel back in, and you're seeing we're using string lines, uh, modern tools and techniques, and we're now reassembling uh, the beam and using string lines and level and getting it all back together. Um, oh, oh, did I do something wrong? I skipped that. Oh, okay, so um, I don't know what you were talking about. Oh, that's that again. But um, here, here is it put back together, nice and straight, level, and it allowed them to install the the the. Uh, the glass partition, there it is. So we can do things, uh, we, ha we have the knowledge, to, not just us, but there are people out there that have the knowledge and capability to uh, build new rooms to look old, uh, patch plaster uh, in beautiful ornate rooms, and then of course, uh, modify plaster uh, to accommodate new structures and then put it back together, and of course, Plaster that is, looks like it should be destroyed, we can't salvage it and meet SHPO uh, standards. So without, uh, I, I don't think I could take it any further without uh, taking any more of your time away. Well, that's, uh, it's amazing, um, once again, to see all these befores and afters. And, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, oh my God, how do you accurately bid, or, you know, how do you accurately estimate your costs when you have a potential job you know, even something like the courthouse that you did here in ohio i mean there must be a lot of legwork and in-person investigation that you are doing as part of the process of coming up with how you're gonna how you're gonna bid uh, a job right yeah well yeah oftentimes we're brought in um as consultants to the architect or owner um and we do surveys and with those surveys, we can obviously tell them what the conditions are and what they can expect. We provide budgets based on uh, what we what we know and understand and what we can project. Um, so that's really useful. Um, when we often find with these kind of projects that the architect um, uses an estimating service or kind of their own wits, um, it's usually terribly wrong and becomes a huge problem in the project because not only is the are the budgets off finance the financials and so someone you know this that obviously upsets everybody but the schedule's thrown off which is really important because now mm -hmm. there's twice the work uh, dollar wise but also now how do you fit that into a schedule when not only we have to do more work but now we may have to let plaster cure so you have to add 21 days of curing and so it's really a huge domino effect so if you could get a plaster company in there or an expert in there that can give some good advice and they're, they're reliable um, and they have no skin in the game where they're, you know, just so, um, where they're just so worried about their own you know, pockets. Uh, and they're, you know, just really um, 
have good integrity, you're going to, you're going to, they're going to advise you well. And mm -hmm. you're so um, some projects, they, they, you know, the owners, architects, they'll design it and tell us they know that there's this much plaster. We can sure. So price that they do put a pot of money aside for um, unknown conditions. And they have us come in after the fact and do a survey and present that survey to them. They go through that survey with us. They may walk every, you know, area, every item and, say okay yeah that makes sense and and then then um then there's some maybe haggle about money but they they knew going in that there was unforeseen conditions and they were wisely prepared for those unforeseen conditions so but um i would say it's really good to get um uh that that you know it's a kind of a term that's used a lot but if you truly can cooperate and collaborate and let the subcontractor someone like us um or others similar to us work and the general contractor CM allows us to communicate with the owner and the architect and the design team. Uh, and they view us as a partner as opposed to some just low level contractor. Um, it's very helpful. Good CMs um, that we've worked with um, really much not only, uh, they, they prefer that because they know they're not expert and they, they feel comfortable that um, someone like us or similar will uh, give good advice and we're at the table. Um, mm -hmm. it's when we're sheltered, um, that's when it becomes a problem, honestly. Okay. Yeah. And those usually are bad relationships with the contract and the owner anyways, honestly. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, I'm curious when you're, you're working on a project, uh, like say the, um, courthouse again here in Ohio, it's not like you figure out what you need to do and it's like well okay crew it's time to head over to the toledo lows to pick up all the stuff we need uh this is obviously um an incredibly uh specific um shopping list that you have is there some sort of secret um old building supply warehouse that you shop at or how do you source all these materials that you need uh, different places and by the way we did go to that toledo home depot did you really <laughs> yes <laughs> no. uh but we um a lot of the materials building materials most of our conventional uh, so we could get you know uh, gypsum plaster. Sometimes we have to go. May, we uh, may have to go to Cleveland. We so we'll, we'll source out and get it trucked over. Um, sometimes we end up as we're driving out to places, we bring supplies with us. So we'll take a box truck worth of goods. Um, sometimes we have to have things shipped in and all that. So it's a, an array of resources um, that we go to. Uh, but there's never one single source, unfortunately. Uh, it's never as convenient as that. Um, but when it came to lime. So the lime we can get sourced in the states. There are different um, suppliers. Uh, there's one. There's well, actually one in Ohio. There's one in Virginia. One in Florida. Um, they are around Maryland. Um, but actually, we the the lime that we used for Maryland, actually the architect specified had to come from England. So we had to deal with that, have it shipped from England, um, and all that goes with it. So they understood that. They understood the cost of all that. We did a job in Hawaii um, on the Big Island, and we were doing exterior lime plaster. Uh, the whole building was clad in lime originally. They used seashell. Seashell is a form of calcium, uh, and um, they, they used seashells to make lime putty back in the 1800s. Uh, for this that project, we had to get our lime putty from France. So mm -hmm. it was shipped over to the U.S., to the East Coast, put on a truck, sent to the West Coast, and put on a boat sent to the island. So it was very expensive. Wow. Yeah. So, but those projects, the owners, they know that going in. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Those are expectations. It's when they don't have any, they don't know and, and they think they know and they get confused when really all hell breaks loose. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but that's so, but now, the, the, um, the architects at the old courthouse did a fantastic job. Uh, they were fantastic in terms of they laid out what they knew. The plaster there generally was in good shape. There were a few things where uh, was unknown, but uh, they were small enough that they were, you know, they had no real bearing on the budget and you know, costs. They minimal kind of uh, effect. Uh, and we we're also dealing with one room, um, and you could see the the extent of the plaster damage uh, for the mm -hmm. most part. Yeah. 
Hey, uh, just curious, do you have a contact information slide at the end of your presentation that we can splash up on the screen as we're I, about to finish up? To head out. Yeah, let's see here. It's probably all the way in the beginning. Bear with me. I will um, go to the beginning. And then I was just curious, uh, company history standpoint, there was or is a John Canning, yes? Yes. Uh, uh, John, I'm typing here as we go. Um, John Canning is, uh, is is the founding of founder of our company. He is very much involved. He's uh, he handles certain projects and he's an expert and he's called in a lot for consulting um, of decorative finishes uh, all over the United States. He um, uh, is he is without a doubt uh, the uh, I would say America's most um, knowledgeable and experienced decorative painter in the United States, in North America for that fact. He immigrated to the United States in the 19, early 1970s uh, and he served this incredible apprenticeship which really doesn't exist anymore. Uh, he served a five-year apprenticeship as a decorative painter and part of this apprenticeship he had to go to, um, he had to, go to college, uh, a building college, um, trade college, uh, three nights a week and then he had to go to art school, all to become a decorative painter. It was a requirement because it was publicly funded. Uh, and he learned um, in his, uh, part of his trade uh, training, he had to learn how to build a wall in order to paint the wall, in order to decorate the wall. So he was required yeah. to, as part of his course assignment, spend a semester uh, learning uh, how to build a brick wall, how to build a paneled wall, a plaster wall, how to make plaster ornaments, uh, how to mix paint, how to make paint, uh, because back then they were still making paint in their shop. As And as a matter of fact, as a result of that, I can make paint in my shop, as we did in Maryland State House. Uh, we make our own paint if we need to, and uh, when called upon. So uh, he, and then from there, he became a church decorator, which was a profession. Um, he was an ornamental painter and church decorator, uh, and he only worked in um, kind of very historic, uh, centuries old, churches in the UK. So when he came to the United States in the 1970s, decorative painting was not really a thing um, anymore. And the trade was completely uh, gone and unionism and training in union and union shops were completely uh, destroyed. So um, he came in at the beginning of the preservation movement, early stages of preservation movement. And people, uh, the Connecticut, um, he did, one of his first projects was Connecticut State House in Battelle Chapel at Yale University, and he uh, uh, that kind of put him on national uh, prominence, and people started calling him about his unique skills and experience, and from there our company took off, um, and so we've been doing this now for 45 years. Wow. Well, um, I'll just remind folks who are still on the webinar at that uh, Heritage Ohio, we do a series of webinars and we have a few coming up. I don't have the list in front of me, but I believe uh, December 2nd is our next webinar where we are talking about uh, the winter city, figuring out how to make your downtown vibrant 12 months out of the year, even if you experience winter. Oh, there we go. Uh, web address, telephone number. In case you have a question, you can get in touch with the pros at uh, John Canyon and Company. It's great to see. We also have a webinar, save your, or save, save the date for December 16th, I believe, for a webinar on the standards for rehab with construction projects. Uh, but at this point, I don't see any other questions. So I'd like to thank David Riccio for joining us today and for this fascinating discussion on decorative plaster and flat plaster. And it's been a pleasure and I hope you all get to Ohio again in the near future to work some of your decorative magic on our buildings that we have here. Well, thank you. It's been an honor, I really appreciate it. And we appreciate the award as well and the recognition for that. Thanks a lot. Uh, oh, it was our pleasure. It was amazing to see that application come in, to see the transformation. So, um, yeah, well deserved. Thank you. So, Take care. thanks everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you at our next webinar. Goodbye.